Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who's looking forward to turkey and sweet potato pie. Remember, Sammy Davis Jr. only had one eye. Here's the captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. And yes, I say that to my family at Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Well, when life gives you lemons, you make lemon shandy. That's what the captain says, and that's what the good folks over at Susquehanna Brewing Company say as well. Today we are drinking Shady Spot Lemon Shandy. This is basically beer and lemonade mingling together in a taste bud tingling harmony. Shady Spot is a world beer cup gold award winner garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five and we have some thanks and praise to hand out to our good friends first up a big cheers to paul in peoria arizona and a big we like your jib from danielle and napa next we have lisa and chad from toronto that say go bucks michigan sucks and a big shout out to Jenny in Austin, Texas. Next up, we have Angie Clark in South Lake Tahoe, California. And last but certainly not least, a big cheers and thank you to Cole Switzer in beautiful Sherwood Park, Canada. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, well, we are thankful. And when you're at truecrimegarage.com, make sure you sign up on our mailing list. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you need more episodes, download the Stitcher app. It's free. And check out our bonus show called Off the Record. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. John Douglas started his career with the FBI in 1970. In the field, he served as a hostage negotiator. He transferred to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, or BSU for short, in 1977, where he taught hostage negotiation and applied criminal psychology at the FBI Academy in Quantico. Douglas later went on to create and manage the FBI's criminal profiling program. While traveling around the country providing instruction to law enforcement agencies, Douglas began interviewing serial killers and other violent sex offenders at various prisons. He interviewed some of the most notable violent criminals as part of the study, including David Berkowitz, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Charles Manson, and Edmund Kemper. He used the information gathered from these interviews, he examined crime scenes, and created profiles of the perpetrators describing their habits, and attempting to predict their next move. In cases where his work helped to capture the criminals, he built strategies for interrogating and prosecuting them as well. Douglas first made a public name for himself with the involvement in the Atlanta child murders. Douglas first made a public name for himself with his involvement in the Atlanta child murders case back in 1977 to 1981. He is the author of two of the garage's favorite true crime books, Mind Hunter and the Cases That Haunt Us. And he's joining us here in the garage today via telephone. And Mr. Douglas, it is an honor to have you joining us once again. Well, thank you. First off, Mr. Douglas, everybody wants to know will there be season three of Mind Hunter? You certainly have the inside track. What can you tell us? Will it happen and when? I tell you, the, uh, now it's like two months ago, I got a call from Holt McCallany, who plays Bill Tench character. He stayed with me uh, uh, when he was developing his part in the show. And, but he, he sounded kind of grim and, and was that uh, all the actors want to return. But it was a question with uh, David Fincher, the director. He spent so much time, so much time filming in Pittsburgh he, for each, each season. He spent about seven months there. And he's such a perfectionist that the actors are, are working almost the entire year on the, you know, on each uh, on e- each series. What they were saying is that he that he's uh, you know exhausted. I just don't personally understand it. Neither the uh, some, uh, some of the actors. Uh, uh, why don't you get you some other directors? Uh, some they were, uh, 
there were, there were other directors involved in, in season one and season two. Of the 19 total episodes in two seasons, Fincher did, did seven of them, personally did seven. But when he did the series House of Cards, he started it, but then other, other directors took over, uh, over for the, uh, for the show. So I don't, I mean, it just, uh, everyone's you know it's hoping it, it, it got tr- tremendous ratings the r- reviews were were all you know all good but i i mean it doesn't uh, for now it's not I mean, he takes you know if you can recall season 2 the first episode i just give you an idea there was a barbecue scene with bill tench and he's meeting his neighbors who are finding out for the first time kind of what he does with the profiling and at quantico and all that. and he started asking questions that one scene uh, was repeated seven, nearly 75 times, 75 times before uh, Fincher approved it, how he wanted that scene uh, to go. I mean, uh, and it's and because I mean, he's made, he's made uh, Netflix a lot of money. You know, if, it was, if it was anyone else, they, say, they would say, okay, it's fine, we'll get another director, but no, they're... They're not doing it, but I, I just, in the back of my mind, I just think they will at some point. Yeah, I mean, I may be dead and buried, but, I, but see, at some point, I hope they'll bring it back. There's so much more to tell. I mean, even season two, the Atlanta child killings. Uh, I mean, that, and 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 your, you know, your uh, people listening to your show have to realize that's based on the book, but it's not the book. Uh, the like the Atlanta case did not go down like that. In fact, in reality, I thought it went down. In the real way, it went down a lot more dramatic. And my role in that case, as far as co- coaching the the uh, prosecution uh, on how to to interrogate him when he would take the stand, uh, my attitude with, toward the, uh, the, uh, the 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 prosecutors and experts that the FBI and the state brought in there, and how how uh, they they were going to throw my ass out of there. They did because I was just so critical of them. Uh, on how they testified, they were so technical, no one could even understand what they were were saying. I mean, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Uh, and the defense experts that they brought in talked, they may have been saying stuff that's not correct, uh, their analysis, but it was, it was clear, it was something that the jurors could follow. And they were nodding their heads like in agreement with, with, uh, with their experts. So um, there's so much... Uh, you know, so they they didn't finish that case. I, I would think of it season three. They got that case. I mean, they got they have. I think there's so many different cases. The, the Ted Bundy case. They could do Robert Hansen up in Alaska who hunted women down like wild animals, which set them loose in the wilderness. And uh, and you have that case. The, the you have that Buffalo twenty two caliber killer. The, I mean, it's just there's the Tylenol case. Then cases of Small, or no one really, the public doesn't even know about, but just very, very interesting, interesting, uh, you know, cases. And they it may not follow the book; they're kind of interpreting it the way they want to. But but it's uh, it's it's better than some of the other shows that uh, uh, that uh, that I've seen. Even like with Criminal Minds, it was a very successful show. But but behavioral science unit, we don't. When you you're in that unit, you don't go. You're not out making arrests. You're not taking cases away from police. You're not kicking down doors. You know it's cerebral when you reach when you reach the uh, the unit. And you're a coach. You're you're coaching uh, uh, FBI. You're coaching local law enforcement on on uh, on on how to to investigate or or uh, you know or lead them. You know. In the best direction for say an un, unknown subject uh, case. So, uh, they, what they portrayed in Mindhunter series was good. And, you know, hopefully, it, it's a five. Year, it was a five year arc to the show. It's supposed to be on for five years, uh, and uh, then there's plenty of cases to fill up those five years. So we will see. Yes, when asked to give a brief description about Mindhunter. When I recommend the show to friends and family, I always say it's the more adult, more intelligent, real life version of Criminal Minds. Yeah, I mean it's just uh, there's such interest in that kind of, that kind of show today and these crime uh, conferences around the country. It just it's, it's amazing. When I haven't done any public speaking because of the COVID virus, but when I've been going out to conferences, eighty ninety percent of the audience are women uh, too that are really. Uh, 
really into the, this. Well, they want to know because they, too, they're, they're the victims of the, of the kind of violent crimes that I and my colleagues have worked over the years, and, and they're interested in to better understand the personality. What creates these people? What makes these people, you know, uh, different than we are? What 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 was their backgrounds? Was it predictable that they would commit, uh, you know, these types of uh, types of crimes? And uh, and now with all these dating services, you know, meeting people, and, you know, at locations, you don't know. You know, just because someone puts a nice picture up and gives you this background bio, this little bio, doesn't mean that's who the person really is. Uh, my mother, when when my I, I, since passed away, she used to tell my sister, when you meet when you meet a man or boy, this was years ago, when you meet a boy, ask him what his relationship is with his mother. And my mother was was right on the money there because of the people who I've interviewed, some of the most violent offenders, there was always an issue on the mother's side where they were there was this abuse or neglect of some of some type uh, uh, going on with them. Uh, and uh, it's they loved their mother and same time they hated their mother. When I interviewed Gary Heidnick from Philadelphia, who kept women in the pit, like in the movie Silence of the Lambs, I interviewed him. Leslie Stahl of Sixty Minutes. Just got to 60 Minutes. That's how long ago it was, in 1991, and followed me into Pittsburgh to interview, where I interviewed Gary Heidnick. And when I got around to talking about his mother, he just went absolutely nuts, you know, and and crying and and uh, you know, and he, he 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 loved her and hated her all at the same time. And she was very very abusive, you know, toward him. And this is not to say that everyone who's good is abused will turn out to be a violent, you know, anything. But I, I'm just saying of the people who I've interviewed. Uh, rarely, I, I, I can't think of one that you could say came from some loving, nurturing kind of uh, background. They all have some type of uh, dysfunction you know, in their lives. Let's talk about the still unsolved terrorizing murders and threats from the unidentified serial killer who called himself the Zodiac. You reviewed and profiled the Zodiac case years after the fact and still were able to offer up some very fascinating and intriguing analysis about the crimes and the person who committed them. Yeah, the uh, with well with the Zodiac, we never the, the unit really never got involved with the uh, the analysis of that case. We've had a lot of people come forward over the years. There's been different suspects, you know, uh, you know, developed. Um, when that case was going on, we really didn't even have a behavioral science unit. When we when we finally got the case, uh, it was it was when so-called Zodiac was writing a communication, wrote a communication to the detective who was assigned to the case. He had a private office, a private line, a hotline. And uh, so we got, we were going to do an analysis of the communication. We call it psycholinguistic analysis. All it is is just you're doing a profile of the author of the communication. Uh, the the uh, police immediately called us up and said, stop, forget about it. Uh, you know, why, why? Why? We figured out who wrote the uh, communication. Who was it? The detective. Why? Yeah, yeah, the detective wrote the communication himself. To he's trying to because he had not had any good leads, no leads. Everything just died. There was nothing going on. And to per- perpetuate the case, he wrote this so-called letter from the uh, you know the the, uh, the Zodiac. So, uh, but as far as I mean, it's it's a case. If it was a case today, I, I, I think we'd be successful. Uh, when you get a case like that, uh, and, and how I was evolving in, when I was the unit chief in the bureau and training others, it's I was kind of de-emphasizing the profile because because the whole the idea of a profile is you're trying to generate leads, you're trying to try to uh, pique the mind of interest of people who may know uh, some of the. Uh, the characteristics of uh, uh, that are fitting this character, uh, uh, the, the person responsible for the crime. So I began to focus in more on on proactive techniques and uh, to, to to maybe get the subject uh, to inject himself in the investigation or get the subject to to go to a particular location uh, because we we may have uh, planted something there. We may have had a memorial service there, uh, and uh, I'll give you an example. I was sent, I, I was sent to go before the 
uh, internal affairs, they call OPR, Office of Professional Responsibility, and, and which is not good when you go before <laughs> internal affairs. And, and so I went, I went before a whole group, and they said, John, you're not lying, are you, to, uh, to the media, through the media, uh, to the public? You're not lying, are you? And I said, I said, what do you mean? Are you, are you telling the truth? I said, well, I don't know. I said, let me give you an example. I said, this, there's a case, in, I, and I told him, there's a case in San Diego that uh, a woman car was uh, broken down on, off the side of the road. She determined she, she ran out of uh, gasoline. Um, no one knows where she is for a day or two. Then they find her up in, in uh, outside of San Diego in some foothills, and she has a, a dog collar around her neck. She's been sexually assaulted, and she's been garroted. Uh, I worked with the police. I, I'm telling the internal affairs this. I worked with the police. We came out with a series of articles. I said, because it was my opinion that that uh, whoever killed her was the guy who picked her up to take her maybe to a gas station. So, gas station, so she thought. And so we, we want to put a series of communications out looking for lead value, did anyone see anything? Did anyone see anything on any vehicle stop, any description of a vehicle or a car? We put that out. We flood the airways, and, and we wait a couple of days, and now we come out with another. another we're getting very good uh, leads, thanking the public. We are now getting a description of not only the vehicle, but the individual who, uh, who, who stopped alongside of the victim's car. Uh, the purpose of that was to get the subject to inject himself into the investigation to, uh, to, to come up with a legitimate reason why he may have been spotted there. And sure enough, the guy it, it injects himself into the investigation that, that I, just so you know, that I was there. I, I offered her a ride. She said she ran out of gas, but she, she said no, so I went on my, on my merry way. So I told Internal Affairs that was, that was the guy. We arrested him, or the police arrested him. Now, if you're telling me, you're telling me, am I lying to the press or whatever? Well, it's not exactly the truth. <laughs> it's not the truth. But we caught this, so they, the police, caught it by using this technique. So what, what, and so they look at me, and they, uh, they said, well, let's, I'll, I'll just tell you something. I said, we understand what you're saying, but if, if it ever gets out or anything, or you, you screw up, man, we're going to have your head. We're going to we're going to have your head. You know, I'll be working cattle rustling cases in Butte, Montana, or someplace They're going to, if if not fired from the bureau. So I started really working on on, on proactive kinds of things and interview interview uh, techniques and, and suggestions because because sometimes you may do a profile and it doesn't fit every characteristic. So someone will say, "Well, this, this that profile they." they they said he would have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a college education, or, and, and this guy, only, he's a high school, high school education. Or, well, we may miss the age, which is difficult. Age is difficult because uh, there's chronological age and behavioral age, and, uh, and you may miss, may miss that. We missed the Arthur Shawcross case up in Rochester, New York. We missed it by about 15 years, and the reason we missed it was because he was incarcerated for those 15 years for a double homicide where he killed two children. And then he gets out of prison. It's unbelievable they let him out of prison after serving 15 years. And he goes up to Rochester and he starts killing prostitutes up in Rochester. So we got everything right, uh, missed the age, but, ca- but uh, we staked out, we, we told him to stake out, if you find a body, don't recover it right away, but stake it out. And so, they, so the cops, they... They get a lead. They, there's a body below a bridge, an overpass below a bridge in the country, and and uh, the, there's a victim down there, and it's frozen over with ice, and uh, they stake it out. And guess what? Police are, are, are surveilling it. Here comes a guy, just sits on on the edge of the, the bridge, eating, having a drink, and the victim is right uh, below him, and, his, and that was Arthur Shawcross serial killer in Rochester, New York. So, so it's, 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 I like the idea of developing, you know, uh, using imagination and creativity to, to catch these guys and, and kind of de-emphasize, like I said, de-emphasize the, uh, uh, the profile. Sometimes you can be right on the money. Some cases, you can forget, you can't, you just can't do it because too many, 
maybe too many types of people could perpetrate this kind of uh, type of, of crime. Uh, and uh, rape cases, we have surviving victims. We could be pretty good uh, once if we do the right kind of interview or, or we coach the we coach the police to determine what was the verbal assault was, what the sexual assault was, and what the physical assault was. Verbal, sexual, physical. And what was it like throughout the first counter with the victim during the sexual assault and afterwards? Verbal, sexual, physical. And if we have that information, we do a good interview. We, that kind of case, we can do a very good profile and come up with because we have a rape type. We have like about five or six rape typologies based upon if we have that kind of information where we can determine pretty good who the offender is. In a similar fashion, in regards to the Zodiac attack at Lake Berryessa, this is the murder of Cecilia Shepard and the attempted murder of Brian Hartnell. During the course of tying up the victims, the Zodiac killer, wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes disguise, he claimed to be an escaped convict from the Montana State Prison in Deer Lodge, Montana where he had killed a guard and stole a car to make a getaway. Now he's telling the young couple he just needed their vehicle and money to drive and escape to Mexico. You had said you would have used that information to try to draw the killer out to present himself to law enforcement and come forward. What would have been your strategy to do so? It would have just been to... You know, to release, I just believe in, in uh, working with the media, investigative reporters with the media, releasing information and not sitting on, you can sit on information for a period of a couple of, you know, maybe a couple of days or so, but at some point you have to, re, you know, release the, uh, re, you know, release the information. Now, whether or not that information was true or not, we, we you know, we wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, we wouldn't have, you know, have uh, known that, uh, uh, again, it would, uh, I'd have to. It's been so long since I even looked at that, you know, that case. But I'll, I'll, let me tell you something else. So it's similar. Uh, the, the what he did, what his technique what, it was. He was trying to defuse the situation. He was trying to calm calm the victims down. Don't worry. All I want is your vehicle. Same thing. I interviewed uh, Dennis Rader, the BTK strangler, in a case. Of, that I did in the 70s, 80s, and, and never, it never, the analysis never led to his arrest. His, his stupidity led to his arrest. But he used that same uh, technique with the Otero family when he killed the Oteros and, and the, uh, the children, the mother and father. That please, please, all I want, you know, I just want your car, you know, and, and, and your money. I'm not going to do anything to you. And, and, and so that they allowed, uh, it was a very good modus operandi. It allowed, him to diffuse the situation and, uh, uh, and gain control of them and, and uh, you know and tie them up. Uh, it's, uh, going back to the zodiac, it's kind of it kind of shows you though that's pretty sophisticated. It's, it's a pretty good mo uh, you know to use, and almost sounds like uh, it's been so long. It almost sounds like a law enforcement technique. Dennis Rader. Uh, was the pseudo law enforcement? You know, he was a compliance officer in town. And he was studying criminal justice at Wichita State. Uh, so, uh, a lot of these serial killer types do have law enforcement backgrounds, like the Golden Gate killer, uh, you know, out there. And uh, but even others who, or you ask them what, uh, what would be your favorite uh, profession? Would be generally it's law enforcement is what they pick. And some of them will act or even actually work as security guards. So, but I, I, sometimes it's disturbing to uh, to see how I can't think of the name. You probably uh, know this, Nick. The the case in Indiana of the two little girls that were on that bridge. Yes, the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German from Delphi, Indiana. I did a, a brief interview on I think it was a Good Morning America, and it, I had that other book out. Uh, Kill across, and they threw out that case, and and they never. I mean, you can sit on that information, but when they sit on had the the audio tapes, the, the audio tapes, and, and uh, you know, it was like I think if I recall, something like "Come with me, follow me," or something like "Come with me." Yes, the perpetrator said, "Guys, down the hill." Yeah, it, 
it's, and it sounds authoritarian. Man, I mean, you know, and they sat on that. For, God, wasn't it like two years or so? It was. It was ridiculous. You don't. You don't sit on on something like, uh, you know, like that. Uh, you know, for that period of time. That case to me, that was a solvable kind of case. That is not a. It's not a case where some stranger comes roaming into a, a community and just by the fluke, you know, and this, I think it was like a winter day, he, he comes across this railroad trestle and he confronts these girls. It's like he has there's this knowledge, a knowledge of the area. That's his comfort zone, that area there, whatever that area is like. I don't, I just don't know. I know it's was, it was just rural. I don't know. We don't know how they were killed. If you knew how they were killed even, uh, you, like I said, you can sit on it for a while, but uh, or uh, but uh, I think it, was, it would have been very soluble. If I would have known, like, were they sexually assaulted? Yes or no? Were they both sexually assaulted? Were they were they, were they redressed? Were they unclothed? Were they, did he pose the bodies? Uh, did he try to secrete the bodies, hide the bodies from uh, from from open view? Are uh, they missing anything? Any jewelry? Any clothing? Or any, anything like that? Uh, method of death. Uh, who can we de- can we determine who was killed first? Uh, Matt, yeah, it, it's a solvable. It's really a solvable case, but not not a year later. T- two years you know, two years later. Uh, I mean, unless they unless they luck out and get DNA, yeah, but it's uh, yeah. It's, I, I just it upsets me sometimes when I I see why didn't they release this information? I mean, I do the same thing with the bureau too. Um, we, with our own their own cases, I and mean, you, you can sit on them for a while, but bits and pieces of information you can certainly let out to the public. Mr. Douglas, you referenced BTK, Dennis Rader, and I was talking about the Zodiac attack at Lake Berryessa. Do you think that there's a high probability, a good chance that Dennis Rader learned that technique by reading about the Zodiac killer? Yes. Yeah, because it's like I said, he, was in, he, he uh, was in criminal justice. In fact, the initial analysis we did, and it was, we did 179, and we, we were just getting going, really. But then we did a really good one in 84 with a group of us. And uh, we, we wanted to focus. We told the focus that over, if you have a criminal justice university nearby, and sure enough, it was Wichita. In retrospect, he went to Wichita. Wichita um, you know, you know and, uh, very, I mean, they will. They follow. Uh, they'll read books and things like that. People will, will always ask, Nick, too, a question like, well, can they learn from from your books, I mean, it becomes like a manual, and, and uh, not, not really, because what? Because you should be able to read. You can see when things are done that the patterns just don't don't always fit there. That, that the the killer may do something to the victim that gives himself away. It may be the way the body is disposed of, uh, say, a parent killing their child, and. Uh, you know, it, and maybe read a book, you know, uh, you know, to okay, well, make sure you don't, uh, uh, you, you know, let somebody else find the victim. Don't be the one to find the victim. Some it's read some case like that. Uh, but in a case like that, when we find, say when we found the victim, we see that things were done to the victim, that uh, the victim was buried. I'm thinking of a case as I'm telling you this is buried in the back of a house, and the uh, the there's plastic bag over the face and uh, part of the body uh, to protect it from really from uh, the, from the, the elements, protect it from the insects and uh, dirt. Uh, it's something that, uh, that, you know, that someone close to the victim would have done. So you know, we're not looking for a stranger, a stranger murder. Uh, so, so you should be able to, you should be able to pick up if someone uh, is following a, a, a case uh, we had we had a case 
of a, a, a of a this was years ago. It was Roy Hazelwood who since passed away. He was real good. He did a lot in the area of rape, and a woman uh, got would get these obscene scene calls, and she got a whistle and she blew the whistle into the phone, and uh, she would be murdered, and a whistle would be found, you know, be thrown on her body. Also, a magazine a magazine that this guy just so happened to have, the killer had, of a woman using that technique on an obscene telephone call. Uh, and these were, these were these old true detective magazines we had, used to have years, years ago. So, so uh, he got back, you know, he got, he got back to her uh, in an indirect, uh, well, in not indirect, a very direct way from a, a magazine uh, and retaliated. But we ended up, you know, getting, getting him as yeah, as well, that guy. You referenced that a criminal could read and could study crimes and possibly read your books to help them get away with murder and avoid being apprehended. One thing that I found fascinating when reviewing some old video footage was a gentleman that you met and spoke with, Mark Byers, who at one time was considered a suspect, at least in the minds of the public, in the West Memphis three case. And I noticed in that video footage when he was being interviewed at his apartment, that there were several of your books on his shelves or his desk. Can you tell us why you believe that Mark Byers is not a good suspect in the West Memphis three case? He had a book that I gave him a book after I I determined he was not a suspect, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the case, uh, Mark Byers. Yeah. He recently, he recently died when, and when he made uh, that series uh, of uh, shows, oh, what was the name of the the, fr- the first one? The first one, uh, the HBO documentary Paradise Lost: The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills. He was plied with alcohol and, and uh, prescription uh, drugs. He was he was scripted, uh, you know, through you know throughout that. Uh, the, the the person who uh, killed those children and. Uh, 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 the, the method and manner of, of disposal told me it was not uh, it was not Mark Byers. Uh, uh, he did not have a history, really, uh, in any kind of a major kind of history of assaultive type of behavior. Uh, it was the other stepfather who was never interviewed by the police throughout the years. Uh, the that fit the analysis that I, I did. Uh, or the team that was working uh, the case, the ch- the, uh, the children, uh, it, it it showed me. And my goal was 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 the could the, the, was it a teenager? Were these three teenagers involved? No, mm-hmm. the way that children were disposed of, they were uh, the children did have their clothes on, which would be a way of controlling the kids if they if they're stripped down, or they could have been playing out there and they could have been naked to begin with when someone approached them. But the way they were disposed of and. The person uh, stuck a stick in the clothing and 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 poked it down under the water. Uh, that is pretty fairly criminally, uh, you know, sophisticated. Uh, the the children died of combination of drowning and, and blunt force uh, uh, trauma. Uh, there were people early on in the investigation said there were teeth marks. There were human teeth marks on the body. It turned out it was uh, animal predation. Uh, you know, you, you, you probably know that, uh, you know, now. Mm-hmm. But getting back to buyers, I spent hours and hours. I mean, I spent uh, uh, with with all the victims. And my goal, after I determined who was who was not responsible, that this is an unsolved case, they, they, they meaning the uh, investigative team, Peter Jackson, uh, the director, who was funding this uh, these experts here, was to talk to the parents, and I got to talk to all the parents except the Moore victim. Uh, they had since divorced, and uh, uh, I got the mother on the phone, and, and uh, I just could not uh, even even have an opportunity to speak with her. I did get to speak to the other victims, uh, the other victims' families, and at first they wanted to throw me out of their homes, but once I sat and explained to them how different things, how, uh, what happened to their children, uh, that uh, that this was not a youthful type of uh, a crime at all, uh, and it was then again the, the person who they came up with as a suspect, who's 
who was the uh, the other f- father, the stepfather who was never interviewed. Do you remember the name, Nick? Terry Hobbs. Yeah, Terry Hobbs. Uh, I got to interview. I did interview uh, him. He did certainly have the history history of uh, of, uh, of of violence. Uh, they found his hair, which was interesting, but it was uh, 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 human hair on a one of the uh, in a ligature of the shoelaces uh, that was used to tie one of the victims as hair. Uh, it was mitochondrial DNA was found on the hair and also on a branch hair that was mitochondrial linked to, you know, linked back uh, to him. But the case, the case isn't going in, in, anywhere because the if they're not if they're not working the investigation uh, at all, they had me speak to the district attorney uh, down there, and and uh, after uh, we came out with uh, uh, you know our show. Peter Jackson uh, produced, and um, it was called uh, West of Memphis, uh, uh, and uh, mm-hmm. the the father. Uh, uh, I got, I'm trying to think of what. Let me, the, I'm trying to think of the uh, that's the name of the show that we we did uh, did. Think. But anyway, West they had Memphis. me talk to the. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. But I, I spoke. I did speak to to the district attorney, and the district attorney. Um, he saw the show. He's kind of miffed uh, about our our take on it. And he says, and he said, I don't. He told me, he said, I don't know. I, I don't know if they uh, did it or not. And I said, I do know. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. And I, and I explained to him the crime scene and and uh, the type of person that would have perpetrated this. These crimes is not a youthful type of an offender. And he tells me though, he says, well, the timing isn't very good. The timing. And I didn't know what he meant. I thought maybe timing because he just released them from prison. But it turned out, like, 30 days later, I find out the timing isn't any good because he's running for political office down there. Uh, and that's why the timing wasn't any good. But no one, to, to this day, I mean, they didn't bring in, like, the Arkansas, Arkansas State Police in. They're a very good police agency. Uh, the Bureau really never got involved you know, in the investigation, uh, you know, either. Uh, they were hell-bent on making this a a uh, satanic type of murder. That was a big thing in that period of time. You had people like Geraldo Rivera on television saying that there's 50,000 children are being abducted yearly and it's shown a satanic connection. Even Oprah Winfrey had a special on her show. Cops were being trained, look for certain graffiti indicating Satanism. And and, uh, yeah, and uh, so they were hell-bent on making that a satanic crime. And you have Damien Eccles and wearing black and... and uh, they had blinders on, and so they they made a case using uh, initially Jesse Miss Kelly, the so-called so-called uh, confession uh, that uh, he uh, you know that he gave. But it's a shame. It was a shame uh, of the wrongful conviction. How the lives you know, were pretty much pretty much destroyed. And uh, and so you know, one book I did, I did a book uh, Law and Disorder it, that includes that case, includes the uh, John Benny Ramsey case. Include the Amanda Knox case, all the cases I was involved with. Uh, I did that a couple of, two years, three years ago, maybe. Thank you guys so much for joining us here in the garage. Join us again tomorrow. If you're not following us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or you can follow the Colonel, the crispiest of Colonels, on the app called Untapped, so you can see what drinks the Colonel has been drinking. That's right. Join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Uh-huh.